And hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Deandra Rose, the director of Polis, the Center for Politics, and a faculty member at Duke University Sanford School of Public Policy. And it is my delight to welcome you to today's fireside chat with SEC Chair Gary Gensler and Polis' distinguished fellow, Ambassador Miriam Sapiro. We're grateful to our co-hosts um, for this afternoon's event, the Fuqua School of Business and also the Duke University Law School. And I'm pleased to introduce Ambassador Sapiro, who will then introduce Chair Gensler. Ambassador Miriam Sapiro is the inaugural Polis Distinguished Fellow at Duke University a non-resident senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a managing director at the communications firm Sard Verbinen, and a member of the board of directors of Lufthansa and Project Hope. She spent more than 25 years in senior leadership roles in the public and private sectors, developing and implementing major policy initiatives and managing complex negotiations, crises, and challenges, including acting as, including as acting in deputy U.S. trade representative, a senior official at the National Security Council, and an international lawyer and member of the policy planning staff at the State Department. Ambassador Sapiro and Chair Gensler, welcome. It's an honor to have both of you here with us today. And Ambassador Sapiro, I am delighted to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rose, for your very generous introduction and also for your terrific leadership at Polis in building a vibrant center for politics at Duke. Mr. Chair and my good friend, Gary Gensler, we are so honored and delighted to be able to have you with us today. I also want to thank Duke Law and the Fuqua School of Business for joining the Sanford Public Policy School in co-sponsoring this event. And I also want to have a special shout out to the teams at the SEC and at Duke who came together to make all this happen. Gary, many people know about your most obvious achievements, like being confirmed as chair of the SEC last April, uh, having served as undersecretary of the Treasury Department for Domestic Finance, having chaired the CFTC under the Obama administration and leading reform of the $400 trillion swaps market. You also worked on the Hill for Senator Sarbanes and helped advise him on drafting Sarbanes Axley. So I, I, I do want people just to know a few other things about you that may be less obvious, but equally important. Um, first of all, you have raised three incredibly talented, wonderful, and independent daughters of whom you are rightfully so, so proud. Uh, second of all, you are great fun to campaign with through the snowy hills of New Hampshire. Remember that trip? Uh, third of all, you love running marathons and climbing mountains, which was probably very good training for your current role as SEC chair. And I'll add a fourth uh, in honor of March Madness and the final four this weekend, uh, when we all hope a certain team will prevail. And that is that you were a terrific professor at MIT. I treasure the invitations to uh, join you in teaching some of your classes. And I especially remember very fondly our last class together, which was just before COVID hit, when you invited the Mexican uh, economics minister uh, to join the conversation. And what made your classes so terrific in my view was not just the stimulating conversations, but that everyone left thinking, what can I do uh, to help the right things happen even more quickly? So in some ways that might be a good motto for your role as chair of the SEC so far, um, working to ensure that investors have the information that they need to assess the risks and make informed decisions. In just the past few weeks alone, we've seen the SEC propose new cybersecurity disclosure requirements, uh, sweeping new disclosure regime for climate related risks, and just yesterday, new rules for SPACs. So we're very eager to hear more about these and other initiatives. Let me turn the Zoom mic over to you for some opening remarks, and then we'll jump into Q&A. By the way, we have received dozens of superb questions from the audience, so I will do my very best to work in as many as I can. Over to you, Gary. Well, it's good to be with the Duke Polis Center, and thank you, 
do I call you Ambassador Shapiro <laughs> or, or can I still just call you Miriam? Uh, but, we can call each other. All right, Miriam thank you. But thank you for inviting me here today. And I promise I'm not gonna give a 20 or 25 minute speech on fixed income market structure. I'd like to, but not, not with a uh, hundred or 200 of your finest students uh, in your political science classes and the like. As Miriam said, we, we've known each other for uh, more years than I can count, uh, but I do remember fondly working together on a number of campaigns. Uh, our candidate didn't win, but it was terrific working with Miriam, even in those uh, hills of New Hampshire. Um, I should say, as is customary, I'd like to note that my views are my own, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission or the SEC staff. All right. I always have to say that for the students. I, I say it in every speech. Um, I understand most of the folks here are public policy undergrads, as well as alumni, faculty, and grad students. And I know there's a bit of a distraction with March Madness. I get it. I get it. And I'm humbled, truly humbled, to be invited to address any Duke community during this month, as you're all celebrating Coach K's remarkable career and yet another Final Four appearance, 13. Oh my, like I grew up rooting for the Terrapins in Maryland and we, you know, we did pretty well, but not quite like Coach K and Duke. And I have a feeling that Saturday's game is gonna be especially exciting. So truly, thank you for taking the time away from that to engage a little bit financial policy topics. Some of you might be wondering though, what does the SEC have to do uh, with all of this, uh, with me and so forth? So I'm gonna go back to April 1st, 1991, exactly 31 years ago, tomorrow. There was a pretty important event there in Durham that day. You might be thinking of the Blue Devils, first national basketball championship. That is the day, 31 years ago. But I, however, am not thinking about that. I'm thinking about a parking garage, a parking garage in Durham. It turns out that the day that Coach K and the Blue Devils first NCAA championship coincided with an, the execution and delivery, get this students, of a municipal bond issuance to support the city of Durham's purchase of a garage. At the time, Durham was operating a 780 space garage located about three miles east of Cameron Indoor Stadium. It was on lease. They needed $11 million. They did a municipal bond issue enabling the transfer of the ownership of that. Now, why do I raise that one example? It was how the city of Durham leverage the municipal bond market. And the municipal bond market in total is a $4 trillion market, allowing local governments to fund everything that you can think of that might be essential and so forth. Well, that $4 trillion market is just one part of our capital markets in the US. We, we actually have 100 trillion plus capital market, but half of it is what you might read about and think about and, 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 and even personally invest on some brokerage app called the equity markets. But the other half, about 50 trillion, is how we fund our government, the treasury markets, how we fund corporations, and how we all actually take out mortgages and take out all the loans and credit card loans, because a lot of those loans get pulled together and they're called securitizations. This $100 trillion market helps our economy go. It also includes crypto. We'll get to that a little later. So what does the SEC role? We're, what's our genesis story? Well, you all study a lot about electoral politics and you study a lot about legislative politics. Well, we had a crisis in the Great Depression, 1929 stock market crash, a lot of other things. The retail public was getting into the capital markets at the time. Franklin Delano Roosevelt comes into office, and you've read a lot probably of his first 100 days in office. Well, one of the things he did right then and there was said the American public had to be better protected in terms of the frauds and scams that were going on when companies were raising money in our capital markets. And that led to a law in 1933, another law in 1934. And in fact, 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt, there were five or six laws passed, 33, 34, and 35, 37, 39, 40. They kept coming back and passing laws to protect investors and help capital markets work. And that was in the middle of the Great Depression. Basic bargains that investors get to decide on what they invest in, but companies can't defraud them. Basic bargains that we have places that you can buy and sell securities called stock exchanges. Back then it was the New York Stock Exchange. Now there's a number of them, of course, that those, those places had to be protected that, against fraud and manipulation. They had to have basic rules of market integrity. Basic bargains about investment funds. You know them as mutual funds maybe, but there's also the private funds and hedge funds that there's basic arrangements around disclosure and fiduciary duties, duties of care, duties of loyalty, best execution, best um, uh, interest in the investors. All of these, plus it's an agency that has the authorities to make sure our accounting and our auditing is proper so that we could have inherent trust in our markets. Our mission, three parts of our mission, protect investors, Facilitate capital formation, that's the issuers, that's the companies and you and me raising money in the mortgage markets. And then that which is in the middle, making sure the middle is efficient, fair, and orderly. We're a five-member commission. You've probably studied the regulatory state. Uh, we're not the only commission around. That means that there's five of us bringing different perspectives, different backgrounds, maybe even different values, trying to uh, do what Congress has asked us to do in our three-part mission. One last thing, we're also a civil law enforcement agency. So we are the agency that's the cop on the beat. We examine against these laws, we inspect against these laws, but we also bring 700 plus law enforcement actions a year. And so every week, the five of us, the commission, gets together in a closed commission meeting, as we will this afternoon. This has been going on for decades on Thursdays. And we meet and we discuss various cases to protect you, the investing public. So with that, the 4,500 people at the SEC have a lot going on, but I turn it to Miriam and uh, look forward to your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for a bit of Duke history. I, I don't think many of us knew. Um, but also for such a great overview of what it is that the SEC does in terms of making sure that the markets operate uh, fairly uh, and um, transparently. Uh, and it also gives us a, a really concrete sense of what it is you do and how you accomplish that mission. Um, and we'll get more into some of these issues in a moment. Uh, let me, let me ask, ask you um, uh, the following question to start. Your one year anniversary is approaching in just a couple of weeks. Uh, you have obviously accomplished an awful lot in uh, almost one year. Um, what, what had you hoped to have also accomplished at this stage that might still be a work in progress? Uh-oh. I think you're on mute. All right, now. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry I got muted and the host unmuted me just there. So Miriam, you were saying, what do we hope to accomplish? Yeah, so you're approaching your one year anniversary in two weeks time. Um, what, and you've accomplished an awful lot that we'll get into. What, is there anything that you would hope to have accomplished by this stage that is still a work in progress? Well, we have uh, a lot to help the public at this agency. We laid out last uh, spring, the commission came together. We laid out a, a reform agenda that included close to four dozen different projects. You mentioned some like the climate disclosure and cyber disclosure and some of the things that we've done most recently. And I'm very proud to say that we've proposed about, proposed or finalized about 30 of those items. So there's still, uh, a dozen and a half or so, or maybe close to two dozen projects, uh, equity market structure, uh, uh, some things around treasury market structure, uh, uh, some resiliency projects, 
still yet to be proposed. Um, we've proposed three things on cyber resiliency. We actually have three other proposals that we're working on uh, around, for instance, the investor notices that we might get if our, if our personal identifying information was tapped into at a broker dealer or an investment manager and the like. So I would say, Mary, I'm very proud of this agency. Uh, I think that we've accomplished a, a lot, but we're in a sense setting the stage. Um, we're not a legislative body, we're a regulatory organization. And what we're, we have authority to do is make proposals within the law, within the chalk lines that Congress has given us authority, put proposals out to the public and get feedback, get economic feedback, get at get what works, what doesn't work, get, of course, sometimes people challenge their legal authorities and get legal feedback. And I encourage all of you, you, could, you can look on our website and give us feedback. It's called public comment. So I would say, Miriam, very proud. We still have some things to get out to propose and then literally start to try to uh, consider those public comments and where appropriate uh, adopt and finalize rules. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it leads me to ask you, um, given the fact we've both worked in the executive branch and we know how hard it is to affect change sometimes, um, now you're a regulator. Um, you have set forth a very robust policy agenda. How is it that you and the commission um, can actually move such an agenda forward in a time where bipartisanship is sometimes just a distant memory and when our country is still facing increasing polarization? Um, it's a great question. And I think that the benefit of, of independent regulatory bodies, and we're just one of many, you, you know, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communication Commission, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission that I was honored to chair, um, have certain authorities from Congress and then based upon those authorities, uh, 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 do move forward with, as you say, policy within, within those defined authorities. Um, and what we do is we, we have a lot of meetings amongst the commissioners um, and, and we negotiate sometimes, we deliberate, we debate, <laughs> but at some point in time, we put a proposal out to the public uh, and um, in this past week, we put out something on the tr on the uh, dealer market. These are these are companies that are making markets, pr providing liquidity to the markets. And we did this one. It's called a dealer trader rule, primarily about treasury markets, but actually broader than that. And uh, it was unanimous. Uh, yesterday, we did something with regard to special purpose acquisition companies. Uh, which had taken off in these last few years to better protect the public, that was uh, a vote of three one. Uh, so, but but I think it's I would give this advice to the students. It's it's listening to all sides, uh, trying to find compromise where you can, even if the if if somebody's going to vote against to try to narrow the differences narrow the gaps. This is something I learned from Paul Sarbanes, working with Senator Sarbanes when he chaired the Senate Banking Committee. I was honored to be one of his senior advisors in what became Sarbanes-Oxley. After Enron had failed, the largest bankruptcy then in the history of the US, another company, WorldCom, it was clear that there was accounting problems. I mean, outright fraud actually happening. And, and Senator Sarbanes had this view, he said to all of us, he said, look, meet with Senator Graham, it was the ranking Republican, meet with Senator Graham, and even if he's gonna vote against it, narrow differences, hear everything out. And I, I think of uh, uh, the Senator quite often, we lost him about a year and a half ago, but I think of that admonition. It's just, it, it, there's good advice and good counsel that comes from all sides. No, I could not agree more. Um, keeping the focus on Congress for a moment more, how does the composition of the House and the Senate affect your work? 
And I ask that given the possibility that come January, there'll be a very different Congress. Uh, one or both houses could flip. Uh, and also given your role in working for Senator Sarbanes, who was one of the giants of the Senate, also very near and dear to my heart, um, but you were working for him when the commission was controlled by the Republicans. So it'd be very interesting to hear your thoughts on the question of the composition of Congress and how it affects your work. I, I've been privileged. I, 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 I dare say I can't believe it's third president I'm serving um, uh, to serve in a number of different uh, situations. When I served in the Clinton administration at the U.S. Department of Treasury, uh, uh, we had a Democrat in the White House and Republicans controlling both branches of the House and the Senate. And we found ways to work together and find uh, some compromises where we could and, and move forward. I served in the Obama administrations at first where the House and Senate was aligned with the president uh, by party. And, uh, and then later over, over my five years, I saw different combinations where first the House and then the Senate uh, uh, changed over. And uh, so, I, I, I look forward to working with Congress regardless of, of the, the leadership. I think that's, that's the role that I'm in right now. And uh, I, have, I have dialogues with ranking members and, and, and um, members of, of the, I'm, I'm saying the chair and the ranking member of the oversight committees and also members of both parties on a regular basis. And, and I would hope that that would continue. And the staff of the SEC briefs and provides legislative assistance. This is something that happens when members of Congress want to write a bill that has something to do with the securities laws. We offer up uh, talented uh, career folks to sort of help give uh, what's called technical assistance or legislative assistance writing those bills. And that's, that's consistent across the board. It's really, really good to hear. Uh, and here's to hoping that bipartisanship is indeed not, not dead. Um, let me ask you about climate. The SEC made a very big announcement last week. Uh, I think it was Monday. Um, as you've noted, several thousand companies are already disclosing information about climate risks and their risk management strategies. I wanted to ask you first um, if you can tell us a bit more about the decision to include scope three emissions in the draft rule. So let me step up a little bit and go back to the, I talked a little bit about Franklin Delano Roosevelt and that basic bargain. There was this basic bargain in the 1930s and a debate, a, a vibrant debate went on. Should, should the federal government been involved? 48 or 49 states already had something called blue sky laws to protect the investing public, but should the federal government get involved? And if so, how? So they decided to get involved, decided ultimately to set up a commission, but decided that the backbone of that was disclosure and anti-fraud, meaning you can't lie to the public. We're not a merit-based regulator primarily. We're primarily a disclosure-based regulator. And that's the basic bargain. The public gets to decide what risk they want to take, whether it's a stock, whether it's a bond, and frankly, whether it's a crypto asset that is uh, like a security. And Congress painted with a very broad brush, and they included about 30 different things in this definition of security. So back to your question about climate, over the 88 years, we at the SEC have added, changed, sometimes deleted too, to the disclosure requirements. The disclosures ones make about when companies merge, the disclosures about uh, executive compensation, uh, disclosures about environmental risks were first layered into the disclosures in the 1970s. It's been 50 years that we've had environmental disclosures. And so over the decades, we change what's in the disclosures based upon investor demands. Investors make investment decisions today in 2022, including analysis about climate risk. Not as true 20, 30 years ago, but I'm talking about today. So we have a role to play the SEC 
which is very similar to the role we played for nine decades. And that's to help bring some standardization, if you wish. Comparability, consistency, help to make it reliable information. Hundreds of companies are doing disclosure. And interestingly, Miriam, and you know, because you're, you've worked so much in the international field, about five years ago in 2017, or actually going a year or two earlier, a group called the Financial Stability Board, which is a G20. There's 20 nations that sort of form this Financial Stability Board. And the Financial Stability Board is a convening mechanism, helps jurisdictions sort of convene around important financial uh, market policy. They pulled together a task force of 30 or so industry folks. This is this thing a task force to look at climate disclosures, the TCFD. And that task force of 30 plus literally market folks, not government officials, but market folks came together with a, a, a disclosure regime that five years later, this TCFD framework has been adopted by literally hundreds of companies. So our role, we put out a proposal to try to bring some consistency and comparability. Now, you did ask about something called scope three. Um, do you want me to kind of go into that? I'm glad to. You but can I, say a few words. I, I think that's um, one of the most so, interesting aspects. So one of the things that we've heard a lot from the investor community and the company community is that the investors are making investment decisions about the greenhouse gas emissions of companies. And some number of years ago, uh, there became a, a sort of an international vocabulary about these emissions. The emissions that come directly from the company, and that's been called scope one. The emissions that have come from the electricity or power that you're buying, so the, the emissions that might come from your power company that you've bought that electricity. And then thirdly, so-called scope three, uh, emissions from your supply chain, uh, or when you sell something, you've got to ship it to your users or the use, the, 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 what's called your value chain, upstream or downstream. So I think what the ambassador's asking me about is, um, how did we approach this? We approached it in a layered approach. We're going to look for public comment. Anybody listening to this, we, we, we look forward to and will benefit from your public comment. We took a layered approach that the greenhouse gas emissions and that so-called scope one, so-called scope two um, would be uh, required to be disclosed, mandatory disclosed. But on the downstream and upstream, the so-called uh, scope three, we took an approach that said that the disclosure would only be required if it was material to the, the, the whole business, or if you've made a commitment, if you've on your own, a company can make a commitment that they say, look, in 20 or 30 years, we're gonna lower our greenhouse gas emissions if you made a commitment to the public about lowering those scope three, um, then it would also be included sort of in that old saying, it's you can't really sort of manage that, that which you don't measure. So if you've made a commitment or it's material, um, we did a number of other things. There's a safe harbor, uh, a safe harbor for uh, uh, on, on the liability side with regard to it. Um, we gave some more time to implement it. Uh, it doesn't apply to small issuers and the like. Um, but this is, of course, out to proposal. It's really helpful to get the public feedback. Yeah. Again, uh, again, you all study legislative and electoral politics. I've been asked to chair uh, a commission that oversees a regulatory process. And so we put things out to public comment. We get the feedback. Uh, we look at those feedback and we see how to adjust and whether to adopt. I want to echo your call to the public, to everyone on this uh, um, Zoom to go ahead and look at the proposed rules and comment and really help the commission 
uh, come up with the best final rules possible. Um, I, I'd like you to just follow up for one second um, on, on, on what you just said about um, commitments and obligations. Is there any danger that far-reaching obligations might have the unintended consequence of um, seeing public companies scale back their commitments because they don't want to be accused of failing to, to meet them? Look, uh, Miriam, I'm going to go back to that basic bargain from the 1930s, disclosure-based regime, not, not a merit-based. So really our, our uh, thoughts on this and how we look at this is if a company has made it a commitment to the future, then disclose that target and disclose your plan to get to that target because it could influence the economics of a shareholder or a bondholder. If a company decides not to make a target, that's up to them. That, that's not, it's, so it's, it's, it's really about risk management for the shareholders. The shareholders making economic choices of buying or selling a security, voting yes or no on a, on a merger or some other proxy vote. Um, and so there's a number of things in this disclosure proposal, but there's others uh, in our environmental disclosures from the 1970s on, we don't mandate things about the environmental protections at companies, mm -hmm. but we do mandate the disclosure about those decisions and those key aspects uh, all within the sense of uh, um, the investor decision making. That's very helpful. Can you say a few words about how the framework that the SEC is proposing might be similar or different to the steps being taken by some of our trading partners, for example, the EU, the UK, Japan, or others? There's a lot of collaboration around the globe that predates uh, my being in this job. And it, it started with something called the Financial Stability Board I mentioned earlier, and then this task force uh, for climate disclosure, the so-called TCFD. And so again, thousands of companies around the globe are using that framework. And uh, we at the SEC thought, let's just, uh, recognize that, see what companies are doing, build some consistency. Um, each jurisdiction has its own laws, each jurisdiction has its own uh, uh, approach, but it, it, there, is a, there is a very uh, a strong um, consistency that Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the UK, the European nations, Switzerland, uh, I've had discussions with the Chinese authorities about this. Um, it, it, there's, there's really a, a global um, recognition that that framework, this, t this, this framework that companies, again, I mentioned TCFD was an industry group or, or 30 plus industry actors that were recommending things up to the Financial Stability Board um, that are building upon that framework of it's, it's disclosure about strategy, governance, risk management, greenhouse gas emissions, and the like. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to turn for a moment to crypto. Uh, you have characterized the current rules as, quote, the Wild West. Uh, tens of millions of people are investing. I, I'm actually, I, I, I'm sorry, Vera, if I could no, say, I, I'm, I'm talking about the crypto markets and the crypto investing space is the wild west. The mm -hmm. rules actually are pretty clear. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I just want to, I'm sorry if I just want to say, no, no, it, okay. but, but if it, 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 I'd love to see a show of hands, but I guess I can't do this on Zoom, but how many of the students and faculty and alumni have invested in crypto? I'm going to look out. <laughs> Oh, I can see a good number. Look, I taught at MIT. There was usually more hands at MIT that went yeah. up on this. But hands are going up. But but all right, I can't really see your hands. <laughs> but 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 let me just say this. I'm sorry to interrupt. If you invest in a cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or one of the others, 
you know, if I asked you to raise your hands again, I would say, are you doing it to use the token to actually get a good or service? I'm looking. I'm not seeing any hands up. All right. Yeah, look, my point of this hypothetical, because I <laughs> wish I could see your hands, is crypto tokens um, are rarely used mm -hmm. to actually secure a good or a service. It is true mm -hmm. that, that some are used on a platform to pay for the platform. You might use them on a mm -hmm. trading platform to get lower uh, fees on the platform, but you're not using them generally to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And, and you're not using them, they are not laundromat tokens. It's not like a token that you're using at the laundromat, you know, in Durham. Uh, people are generally buying them in anticipation of profits based upon the efforts of others. And I said earlier, Congress painted with a broad brush in the 1930s. Our laws have been amended many times since then. They've painted it with even a wider brush. The mm -hmm. Supreme Court has weighed in numerous times, and they've said basically to protect the public against fraud, to protect the public against scammers, there would be an agency, the SEC, a cop on the beat, where people raising money from the public had to register and make basic disclosures. And my predecessor said it, I will say it, most of these tokens, I'm not prejudging any one of them, most of these tokens are just that. They're investment contracts under the Supreme Court's Howey a case of the 1940s. We as an agency and the courts have found investments in orange groves in Florida, whiskey caskets, ostriches in Texas, I mean, dozens of examples I could share with you that are investment contracts because it's the basic thing. Are you investing in something with the anticipation of profits based on the efforts of others? And they, are those others raising money so that they too can you know, pursue an entrepreneurial idea? And so it's right now a bit of the wild west. I, I, I think that that's accurate. I, I, there's a, 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 a lot that we can do I've, to, to bring this, uh, these trading platforms and lending platforms inside an investor protection uh, remit. Um, a lot we can do. Without SES. that, failing that, I think there's going to be, you know, a lot of people are going to uh, find, you know, the ups and downs of markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they're going to be hurt or or hurt by scammers and fraudsters. Um, I also wanted to ask you, because, again, you know more about the risks and the potential of crypto than anyone else uh, that I can think of. Um, how are you, how concerned are you that Russians and others subject to U.S. sanctions uh, are using crypto to try and avoid or mitigate the impact? Um. Look, I think that it's, it's interesting that, that when uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, I'm sorry, does anybody want to raise their hand if you know who Satoshi Nakamoto actually is? Satoshi Nakamoto wrote this eight page paper in Halloween night in 2008, uh, right in the middle of the financial crisis that barely got noticed. But it's interesting to me, Satoshi Nakamoto's a Bitcoin white paper was put on a cypherpunk mailing list. It was a bunch of cryptographers that, you know, frankly, were working on projects like this for 20 some years to be, yes, somewhat off the grid. It was to have a decentralized form of money that was not relying on a central authority, a central bank or commercial banks. So it's not surprising, Miriam, that within just a few short years after 2008, that folks around the globe found that you know, they could maybe use Bitcoin to sidestep another set of public policies. You see, starting in the 1970s and 80s around the globe, nation after nation layered over our financial system a law enforcement set of public policies. They're called anti-money laundering and the Bank Secrecy Act in the US, but they're called other things elsewhere. Also layering a form of, of, of sanctions. We'd have sanctions, they're called blockades since antiquity, 
but through public policy, layering that over our digital money system. But it shouldn't be surprising that sometime somebody came along with a possible technology, and that's what cryptocurrencies are, a new technology comes along. And one of the things that started to happen by 2010 and 11 and 12 was the use of cryptocurrencies to sidestep those public policy goals of guarding against illicit activity, tax compliance, and thirdly, sanctions. So you ask about today, um, could you, and I'm talking in the hypothetical, could one use crypto to sidestep either illicit activity, tax compliance, or sanctions? And the answer is possibly. You could also use fiat money, possibly. The question is how um, the official sector comes together to ensure that we still achieve the basic public policy goals. And I, I would say this about investor protection as well. Okay. Um, we're technology neutral. I say I'm technology neutral. When I was proud to be a professor up at MIT teaching some of this stuff, I was not technology neutral. But okay. like I'm yeah, technology neutral, um, but I'm not public policy neutral. The SEC's major remit, investor protection, guarding against fraud, manipulation, front running, the like. But there's also a set of really important public policy goals, US Department of Treasury, Federal Reserve, Justice Department, many. We share some of this is a guarding against illicit activity, the sanctions regime that you mentioned as well. Um, let me also ask you about cyber. Um, we, we know the threats are very real and they predated Russia's increased aggression against Ukraine, but now people have to be even more vigilant. Um, the SEC, as we mentioned, has um, already played an important role in terms of um, drafting a rule regarding disclosures. What, in your view, could other agencies do that um, would help buttress the SEC's work in this area? Well, you're, you're kind of asked, but I've, I've, I've learned long ago, you, it's best to, <laughs> whatever advice I might have for other agencies, I would uh, not do on a, this public call. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, Miriam, you survived. No, like, like we've got enough to do at the SEC, it's but let me just say, let me say cyber is really a team sport. Jen Easterly, who runs the, uh, there's a group called CISA, C-I-S-A. It's part of the Department of Homeland Securities. And Jen is just this remarkable public servant. Uh, she served her nation admirably in so many roles in the past in the, in, the, in the military and elsewhere. And Jen once said in a speech last year, you know, cyber is a team sport. CISA, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI, and so forth, they're, they're kind of the, 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 the team leads on, on, on cyber. But the SEC has a role to play as well. Uh, there's two broad ones. One is re related to the financial sector itself, the exchanges, the clearinghouses, the, the big fund complexes, uh, you know, the mutual fund companies and the like, the, the broker dealers and the big, big participants. Those financial sector players, we did adopt in 2014 a rule about it's called systems compliance and integrity about some of the largest like stock exchange and clearinghouses. But when I came in last year, I said, let's think about cyber across a whole remit. We've done three of what will end up being about six different proposals in this area. Um, five of them related to the financial sector, the investment advisors, the broker dealers, the notices that we might get ourselves, Mm -hmm. some of the trading platforms and the like. The other piece that we and role we have is with regard to the companies, the issuers. And just like we've, we've done with climate risk disclosure, we thought it was appropriate to try to bring some consistency and comparability to how companies talk to their investors about how they're managing cyber risk. So I hope that gives you a sense of mm -hmm. what we're doing. I don't yes. know if there's one last question or something because yeah. we're, we're bad at time, but what, yeah. what, what do you... Uh, Wait, what, or you'll probably sneak two in. Um, I'm going to try to sneak two in if I can, um, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, I wanted to ask you briefly about China. The SEC has been at the forefront of requiring uh, companies, uh, whether foreign or domestic, 
to have adequate disclosures. And as we know, not all foreign companies uh, have done that. Uh, and if they don't, they'll risk being delisted from US exchanges. So there've been reports lately that China is now working to try to find a way to permit its companies to provide more information. I'm curious as to whether you think uh, such reports are credible uh, and whether there might be a solution identified before the delisting kicks in in a couple of years. So Miriam, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give the students a little um, background on this and then ask you a question. So uh, the background is, so I've talked about that basic bargain. Investors get to decide based upon the disclosures of companies. And accounting is at the center of this. And the SEC in the 1930s got authority over accounting standards. Um, many accounting standards are done. Uh, they're, they're what's called generally accepted accounting. And auditing means checking on those books and records. About 20 years ago, when a couple of companies were kind of, you know, blowing up, Enron, the largest bankruptcy and so forth, uh, another law was passed called Sarbanes-Oxley. This is the senator I mentioned earlier, Paul Sarbanes. And in that law, another basic bargain, a mini basic bargain was, okay, the auditors, the people looking at the books and records had to follow a set of standards set by a new organization called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. That new organization didn't exist before, would take on a lot of the responsibilities that had been done by industry, had been done by the American Institute of Certified Public Accounts, the AICPA. They were sort of saying, okay, let's take that out of the industry and put it in something. We at the SEC oversee this thing called the PCAOB. And the basic bargain there was the PCOB would set auditing standards, we at the SEC have to vote on them and approve them. And the PCOB would inspect against those auditing standards. <clears throat> 18 years later, 50 plus countries had allowed for such inspections. Two had not. And so Congress got back involved and they got back involved in 2020. So it predates this administration and said, you know, you, you've got to, if you want to be in the US capital markets, you have to have these basic protections that the auditors follow a set of standards and the auditors are open to inspection. And fundamentally, it's about trust in our capital markets. It's all comes down to just trust in our capital markets. And 50 other jurisdictions are complying with it and two aren't. And so they set a three year clock a three-year clock, and the two jurisdictions were a Hong Kong and then some issuers in, I'm sorry, China and some issuers in Hong Kong. Um, so that's where we are. My question back to you, Miriam, you've negotiated these things with other great nations. China, you've also negotiated with. Any advice that you have? I, I think that uh, it's, it's a hard one here because um, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a hard ask from the United States, we want to protect our capital markets. We've been doing this for 20 years this way, 50 other jurisdictions it's worked with. But it's hard for our, our with all respect, our you know, really uh, good colleagues or, or international colleagues in China. It's hard because they haven't been um, able to allow this for these years. Congress weighs in and said, you got a three-year clock. It's, it's, it's got to happen. And we might see at the end of the three years that 200, 250 companies get suspended from trading in the US. I think in a way you've answered your own question um, because it really goes to the question of full and fair disclosure and making sure that investors uh, in the US, which of course is, is what you're focused on, have that information as they're making investors. Yeah. And, and in and this case, I would, maybe something I would Chinese investors that... would also like to know, but they don't have the ability to, to make that kind of yeah. And I would say, Miriam, and you probably found it in the job when you were a, a US trade rep um, and deputy US trade rep, our conversations with our counterparts have been very respectful, very thoughtful. Um, but ultimately it's, you know, it's sort of a decision of a foreign jurisdiction mm -hmm. how they want 
their companies from their jurisdiction to engage in our capital markets. Um, well, that's why I, I, I found these reports encouraging if they're credible. So I think obviously there's still time, um, but um, hopefully there'll be a, a, a sound um, uh, decision adopted uh, that will enable um, this issue to go away in the sense that investors will have the kind of information that they need. So I'm gonna let you decide. Do you have time for one or two more questions? Uh, uh, no, not two. Okay, All <laughs> I'm right. sorry, I, I have to no, be no, okay. apologetic to- uh, no, just, no, you've been generous I, with your time. Let, let me say something about it. Miriam's so good. She came up to MIT year after year. Uh, Simon Johnson and I were doing a course called Public Policy in the Private Sector. This is like, we didn't have the Harvard Kennedy School, but it was kind of fun to do a little public policy inside of MIT. And that was on, on the side of, I was mostly doing um, tech, the intersection of technology and finance. So it was uh, cryptocurrencies and finance and artificial intelligence and finance was my main work. But Miriam was kind enough each year to come up and talk about trade policy with, uh, we, used, we used to have about 40 students in a room. And it was great. We did it over dinner. I'm, I'm sorry we can't do this over lunch on, <laughs> on Zoom, but uh, we'd love to get you back live at some point and then you can actually ask people to raise their hands. So. The last question is, looking at your incredible career path, what advice do you have for the students in the audience about the various paths that they may take and even share with us, if you can, the best advice that you've ever gotten in this regard? Wow. Um, look, I would say this. You only get one go in this beautiful thing called life. Um, I don't know, your beliefs might be different than mine, but I think God just gives us one ticket to the merry-go-round. And so just make the most of it, and you're going to be the only person at some level that's going to manage your career. I mean, my mom gave me some great advice, my identical twin brother, but at the and, and my lovely wife, Francesca, but you're going to have to sort of find your own path. I find that the people that do best they find the, the sweet spot of an intersection of their passion, their abilities, and frankly, the market. <laughs> you know, a, a guy like me, if I had been passionate enough to, you know, play for Coach K, bringing it back to Duke basketball, which is the only thing I know that matters in Duke right now, I, I could have this. never, I could have <laughs> never played for Coach K. I was a coxie, you know, the little guy at the end of the uh, at University of Pennsylvania. I was the coxie at the end of a in a eight or shell or four or shell. You know, that was that was my lot in life. You know, the little guy. <laughs> so, you know, but passion, your own abilities, you're going to be a lot happier. You're going to be better at the job. You're going to dig in. Of course, you'd hope that there's somebody that will pay for those services, whatever your passion and, and, and abilities are. Um, I, I think that would be my key. If your passion uh, aligns with your abilities, just pursue it. You're going to be a lot happier. You're going to contribute a lot more to society. Um, I'd say, secondly, be willing to have real goals for yourself and hold yourself accountable to the goals that you want in your career and in your personal life. Um, stay true to your values. A lot of times in the private and public sector, you'll find people are gonna to try to throw an organization or an individual off your game, off your values. It's not worth it. Stay true to your values. Um, know that your competitors are always trying to throw you off something, maybe not off your values, but they're, they're going to want to throw you off your game because they want to outcompete you. And that's true in the private sector and in the public sector, you know. Um, and um, uh, so you got to also stay true, know the difference between goals, strategy and tactics. And too often people debate tactics all the time and they confuse that's the real thing is setting true goals and figuring out strategies to achieve that. But I bring it back to your career, knowing that. Um, and I'd say uh, find a good partner to share life with. 
I lost Francesca 16 years ago. I was a stay-at-home dad for a number of years and raising these three beautiful girls, or they raised me, whichever. <laughs> um, I'm blessed to have a wonderful uh, partner now, uh, uh, Connie. Uh, you know, he's a great documentary filmmaker, and we met on Match.com. Go figure. Um, uh, but a, you know, having a great partner with you. On your last question, the advice I got from somebody, I think it's just really a cl clever little line that, that, that somebody who studies careers, this is somebody who's written books on careers and so forth. He said, the most important person is not your boss, it's your boss's boss. And it was just an interesting play on words, but they, they sort of observed your boss, if you do a really great job, might not promote you because they don't want to lose you but it's your boss's boss that might have an idea that you need to be moved around an organization. So mm -hmm. I hope that's helpful. That is incredibly helpful. I cannot think of a better note to end this terrific conversation on, Mr. Chair. We are so grateful for your being able to spend time with us today. Um, really, we can't thank you enough. I also wanna thank the audience for joining us. And again, we'd love to have you back live at some point. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Miriam.